Um, so today we're doing, do y'all you, you like my virtual background? It's skeletons today. So we are doing the skeletal system. Um, and so um, this chapter really focuses on essentially the bones of your skeletal system. Um, so we're going to walk through all the bones. Um, we'll walk through, um, in terms of your skeleton, we have over 200 bones. We kind of divide them up into the axial skeleton. And how I remember that is I think like axis, like the axis in your, like the, um, the um, axle, that's the word I'm looking for, the axle for the wheels of your car, right? Things rotate around it. And so I think axial skeleton, it's everything right in the middle. You can kind of rotate around it. So it is the skull, the vertebrae, and then we call it the bony thorax, which is basically the ribs and the sternum. It's just right in the middle. And then the appendicular skeleton is everything else. So it's the shoulders, the arms, the hips, the legs, okay? So we're going to walk through the skeleton, talk about all those bones. At the very end of this chapter, we will go over a couple of disorders that are associated with the skeleton and the formation of your bones, especially in an embryo. Um, so the skeleton is mostly bones. Obviously, we know when you look at a skeleton like I have back here, um, it's mostly bones, but there is some cartilage, right? So we have cartilage that connects the ribs to the sternum. Um, we also have cartilage at the ends of all of our bones. We call that articular cartilage. Um, we also have within our skeleton, we have joints. Now we are gonna talk about joints in the next chapter. So next week for chapter eight, we'll do joints. Joints are essential because they allow for movement but they are the weakest part of our skeleton. Our skeleton would be much stronger if we were one bone from head to toe, right? But then we'd have no movement. There'd be no hinging. And the other thing are ligaments. Ligaments are gonna connect all of your bones together. So those are also essential. Now your skeleton makes up about 20% of the mass of your body. Um, and so, you know, you've heard people say, um, you know, he's, he's just big boned. So I used to have a cat that was super fat. His name was Clyde. And my friends would joke about how fat he was. And I would always say, he's just big boned, right? So sometimes people will say, oh, they're just big boned, thinking your bones are bigger and they're making up more of your mass, right? That's not necessarily true. That doesn't actually happen. Bones are typically 20% of your body mass. Again, we divide our bones into axial and appendicular. And that's how we will go through them today. So this right here is showing you in blue, in this image, everything that's blue, you can see the axial skeleton. So this is everything right in the middle, right? It's the skull, it's the vertebrae, and then you can see we call this the bony thorax. So it's the ribs and the sternum. So we're gonna go through the skull, then we'll do the vertebrae, then we'll do the bony thorax. Okay, so we would say the skull by far is the body's most complicated bony structure. In fact, you know, in lab this week, if you look at that study list at the end of your PDF, you're going to see for the skull, you're going to see the most bones and bone markings for that. For any other bone, it's going to be the skull where you have the most. Your skull has tons of grooves and depressions and projections, allowing for muscles and blood vessels and nerves to pass through. So your skull is incredibly complex. So we actually say that your skull is divided into the cranial bones and the facial bones. So the cranial bones are all the bones that sort of surround where the brain sits. Okay, So they're going to protect the brain. They're also a site for a lot of head muscle attachment, right? So like the muscle right here that allows you to raise your eyebrows, it's connected to those cranial bones in the front. Now your facial bones are the ones right in front. These are gonna supply the framework for your face. So they're giving your face a structure. They're also housing your sense organs like your eyes and your nose and your teeth and your mouth. They're providing openings like for air, for food, okay? And 
They also anchor a lot of your facial muscles for facial expression. So like smiling, right? Um, that's all coming from those facial bones. So I'm going to walk you through your cranial bones and your facial bones. So we have eight cranial bones. Now I will tell you that for your skull, almost every bone with a few exceptions is paired. You're going to find this throughout your entire body. If you do a cut, a mid sagittal or a medial cut, remember this means right down the middle, what you're going to find is that you're going to have a bone on the right and a bone on the left, right? So in your face and throughout your body, your bones are paired. You have one on the right, one on the left. Your skull is no different. So in the cranium, you have, here I'll show you a picture. I don't have a picture. All right, you have two parietal bones. They kind of sit on the sides. You have two temporal bones. These are right above your ears, like around your temple. One on the right, one on the left. Now you do have for your cranial bones, you have some that are not paired. So your frontal bone is the one right in the front. It's your forehead. There's only one of those. I'll circle where the ones we only have one of. Your occipital bone is in the back. You only have one of those. And then um, you have your sphenoid and your ethmoid bone. So we just kind of went around the top here. The sphenoid and ethmoid bone sit on the inside. So if I were to kind of like cut my skull this way and lift the top of my skull off and look down at the floor of the cranial cavity, that's where you find the sphenoid and the ethmoid bone. Again, these are also not paired. Okay. Now for our facial bones, these are the ones up front. We have a mandible, which is basically your jaw. There's only one of those. And a vomer bone, which kind of sits in the nose. There's only one of those. All the rest of your facial bones are paired. So you have maxilla bones. These are like your uh, bones in here. It's everything up above your top teeth and kind of comes up and around. That's all the maxilla bone. You have two zygomatic bones. Your zygomatic bones are sort of like your cheekbones. Um, you do have two nasal bones. Your nasal bones are right in here. They make up sort of the bridge of your nose. Your lacrimal bones are in the, um, as you walk into your eyes, they're just in a little bit farther. You actually have um, little holes in your lacrimal bones called the lacrimal fossa. And these little holes are where your tear ducts are coming from, okay, and helping to drain. You have two palatine bones. These are actually in the roof of your mouth, and they're making up part of your hard palate on the top of your mouth. And then we have two inferior nasal conch, and these are folds that are inside the nose, okay. So we do say, and notice at the bottom I have this starred, for your facial bones, the only bones that are not paired are the mandible and the vomer bones. That's it. All the others are paired. Now we also have, and I will go over pictures of these with you on Wednesday. So I'll go over where you can find all of these and talk more about these on Wednesday. Now inside of your skull bones, you also have open spaces called sinuses. Um, these open spaces that are sort of within the bone, these are lined with muc mucus. They have, are filled with air and basically the job is they help to lighten your skull. Anytime a bone is hollow, it is not nearly as dense. So they make your skull a little bit lighter. They also help to enhance the resonance of your voice. You know this. Because when you, you have too much mucus, right, if you're sick and you have an overproduction of mucus, it ends up clogging your sinuses. That's when your sinuses feel um, like pr there's pressure there. And I always think, you know, when I have a cold, where do I feel pressure? I feel it here, right? I'll feel it here. And sometimes like I'll feel it in my eyes. Like if you rub your eyes, it just feels like your eyes are gonna pop out of your head. That is exactly where your sinuses are. So you have sinuses, you have a frontal sinus, which is right here. You have uh, maxillary sinuses, which are right here. 
And then you also have, sometimes we call these your deep sinuses. Oops, I don't know why that connects every time. Your deep sinuses are in the orbitals. They're in your eye sockets. So those are the sphenoid and the ethmoid sinuses. And so here's a great picture of these. So you can see these from a frontal view, right? We can see our frontal sinuses in purple, the maxillary sinuses right here, and then the sphenoid and ethmoid sinuses. I know it kind of looks like they're on the sides of your nose, but they're not. They're actually deep in your eyes. So if we flip over and look at this from a lateral view, from a side view, now you can see those sphenoid and ethmoid sinuses, and you can see how deep in the orbitals they go, okay? Now, another bone I wanna mention, and we are gonna look at this um, in lab on Wednesday when we do our chapter seven lab, is the hyoid bone. Now, the hyoid bone, I don't know if you can see behind me um, what I'm pointing out. I'll use my finger instead. So it is right below the skull, and it is sort of this U-shaped bone right below the skull. It's not actually part of the skull. Um, this bone is pretty interesting. This is the only bone in the body that does not articulate. Directly with any other bone. That term articulate means it's just a joint. So basically it's not forming a joint. The hyoid bone is actually held in place by muscle. And this is a bone that really helps to raise and lower your larynx when you're swallowing and when you're speaking. Um, and so, you know, your Adam's apple right in here that guys have, and ladies, we have one too. Ours just isn't quite as big. Um, the hyoid bone, when you swallow, you can feel that move, that larynx move, and your hyoid bone is helping that happen. So it's the only bone in the body that's not articulated with any bone. It's just held in place with some muscle. Now this also happens to be the same bone where if they're doing an autopsy and this bone has been crushed or broken, then that person um, has been strangled, right? The only way that that bone can get crushed or broken is if you put enough pressure here it's way up under the mandible. So you have to put enough pressure here where you're gonna block the windpipe, you're gonna block the trachea and cause a crushing of that bone. So if you ever watch like NCIS or Criminal Minds or I don't know, Law and Order, any of those shows, they may have talked about that before. All right, and some other bones that are in the axial skeleton are, are vertebrae, right? Those are in the back. We have 26 vertebrae, and vertebrae are considered irregular bones. We talked about that last week at the beginning of the week, chapter six. Um, <clears throat> and our vertebrae are divided into cervical, which are in the, the neck, thoracic, which are sort of in the middle, lumbar, which are the lower back, and then the sacrum, which is very low. Now, the number of vertebrae that you have for each of these, the way I remember is I think of the times of day that you eat. So you have seven cervical vertebrae. You eat breakfast at seven. You have 12 thoracic vertebrae. You eat lunch at noon. And you have five lumbar vertebrae. You eat dinner at five, right? So that is, for me, a really easy way to remember the numbers of vertebrae. Now your sacrum is actually, it has about five vertebrae in it that are all fused together. So it looks a little different. So I'll show you that one. So we can see up here in blue, these are our seven cervical vertebrae. Here in green, those are our 12 thoracic. Down here in purple, those are our five lumbar. Now if you look in orange down here, those are the um, sacral vertebrae that have all fused together. So you can see they're not separate from each other. Um, and then at the very bottom, you have a coccyx, which again is like four vertebrae fused together. It's much smaller. Sometimes we call this the tailbone, okay? Um, now in terms of your vertebrae, oops, okay, sorry, I wanted to make sure I didn't have that on another slide. In terms of your vertebrae, so we have certain numbers of each. 
we also give them names. Like for example, our cervical vertebrae are called C1 through C7. So we can see that here. I have to move that over there. Okay. Our thoracic vertebrae are T1 through T12. Lumbar vertebrae are L1 through L5. This, the way we give these sort of number names makes it a lot easier for us to identify which vertebrae we're talking about. So like, for example, let's say somebody has a herniated disc or they have a problem. And let's say the herniated disc is right here, right? And this is where that, that pad of cartilage right there has bulged and it's maybe pushing on the spinal cord or pushing on a nerve and it's causing a lot of pain. A doctor, when they do uh, an MRI, they would say, oh, okay, this patient has a herniated disc between L2 and L3. So the fact that we give these number names makes it a lot easier for us to identify the vertebrae. Okay. Now, we also have a curvature here, a normal curve. Now, notice if you're looking at this this image on the left, that curve, it's nice and straight. There is no curve. That's because we are looking at the vertebrae from the front. Now, if somebody turns to the side and we look at it from the side, there is a curve and this is a normal curve. So we find typically that it will be concave, meaning it's sort of pushing in, in the cervical and the lumbar region. And it's convex, pushing out in the thoracic and the sacral region. So that is a very normal spinal curvature, but we also have some abnormal curvatures, right? So one of them is scoliosis. Scoliosis is an abnormal lateral curve. And so that means if you are looking at someone from the front, instead of the vertebrae being nice and straight, they'll curve to the side. So they'll have a lateral curve to them. Let me show you a picture. So the image here on the right, those two images on the right, so this one and this one, um, this is scoliosis, an abnormal lateral curve. So you're looking at the patient, in this case, we're looking at them from behind, and you can see that instead of being straight, the vertebral column does that. So it has an abnormal lateral curve. You can see when the patient bends over, you can see there's an abnormal lateral curve, which also is typically accompanied with abnormalities of the rib cage. And you can see that here really well. So the treatment for scoliosis, typically they cut the patient down the back. They will straighten out the vertebrae as much as they can without damaging the spinal cord or causing any nerves to be pinched and they will place long rods down both sides of the vertebrae and screw them in place. They oftentimes will also have to break ribs to allow those ribs uh, to, to move and, and form in a better shape, okay? Now, sometimes um, if scoliosis isn't terrible, sometimes you might be able to have um, a back brace and wear a back brace, especially if they catch it when you're pretty young and as you're growing, your bones, when you're young, your bones are really soft. Remember, we talked about that last week. Bones don't have a lot of calcium in them when you're young, and so they're much softer, so it's a lot easier to manipulate them um, in a child. So back brace might work. You all might remember, I remember in um, gym class and PE, um, we always had to have a scoliosis check where we would have to bend over and then the nurse would follow our vertebrae with her finger. Right. Now they do it at the pediatrician. I just went back because we have two other abnormalities and images there. So one is called kyphosis. Kyphosis is a hunchback. So it basically is an exaggerated thoracic curve. So the thoracic curve is normally con, con, uh, con, convex. Sorry, convex, and it's usually more exaggerated, so it causes you to be sort of hunched over. So here's a great example of that, um, this image on the left, right? So this one um, is uh, kyphosis. So you can see how exaggerated that convex curve is, right? It's even more. Um, we find this typically in elderly individuals, right? As the muscles um, degenerate, as you lose your strength, that's really easy for that to happen. 
And then the last one is lordosis. This is sway back. So this is an exaggerated lumbar curve. So it's an exaggerated concave curve. So here you can see a little girl with lordosis, right? So this is in the lumbar region. Um, this is also very common in pregnant women. If you think about it, you're carrying this big baby, all this extra weight in front of you. And so it's not uncommon for pregnant women, especially in that last trimester, to develop lordosis. Once they have their baby, it goes away, but that is super common. Now, I mentioned this just a little bit about the vertebrae, is that in between those 26 vertebrae, you do have cushions. You have intervertebral discs. That name makes sense. Inter means between. So these are discs between the vertebrae. I want to talk briefly about what that disc looks like. Um, it is made of cartilage, fibrocartilage, which is a really tough cartilage. We have it between our vertebrae in the intervertebral discs. We also have fibrocartilage in our knee joint, in the meniscus of the knee. And so um, this image right here on the right, this is showing you looking down on a vertebrae and you can see the disc right here, that gray disc. Now the disc has two parts to it. It has this tough part around the outside, okay? And that tough part has a little lighter gray color to it. That tough part is called the annulus fibrosis. Okay. And then on the inside, where it's a little darker gray, there's a more gelatinous type material called the nucleus pulposus. I don't know why that connects. And so you can see down here the annulus fibrosis and the nucleus pulposus. So the way I think about this disc, um, you all know Gushers candy? The, I don't, do they make that anymore? I don't know. Um, it's like the gummy candy that has like liquid on the inside. Grosses me out. Um, but that's the way I think about these discs. So the outside is a little more tough and then the inside is more jelly-like, okay? Um, and so the way I remember the names of these is I think of the inside as the nucleus pulposus. So think of those two words, nucleus, nucleus of a cell, it's right in the middle, it's on the inside. Pulposus, I remember pulp, like orange juice pulp, right? It comes from the inside of the orange. So nucleus pulposus, two things coming from the inside. And then the annulus fibrosis is around the outside. So what happens oftentimes is um, as people age, the discs become um, less strong. They start to degenerate. And as you age, it is not uncommon for the disc to fail, for that tough outside part to get weaker. And it fails and it ruptures and the squishy inside part starts to bulge out. We call this a herniated disc. And so you can see that right here, okay? You can see where that tough outside part has thinned down a lot and the inside part is squeezing out right there. Think about all the pressure that's on your back and on those discs. So if it has a weak point, it's gonna start to squeeze out. Unfortunately, these weak points where they squeeze out Oftentimes, they're going to squeeze and pinch a nerve. Like in this case, you can see it's pinching that spinal nerve. Sometimes they'll squeeze out and pinch right in the middle where that spinal cord is. And sometimes they'll pinch on the other side, the other nerve. Depending on where a disc is herniated will determine the pain that you're having. Um, so like, for example, if somebody has a herniated disc in the cervical region, okay, if you herniate it up here in the neck, the nerves that come off in the cervical region, typically they're gonna supply the neck and the arms. 
So if it's pinching one of the nerves, let's say it's pinching a nerve on the right hand side, you're either going to feel it on the right side of your neck or you're going to feel it down into your arms and your fingers. And a lot of times it'll feel like numbness and tingling. It might feel like a burning sensation. Um, it might be sharp shooting pain. It just depends on the person. Um, and so a lot of times it'll be on the right side if it's pinching the nerves on the right or it'll be on the left side if it's pinching the nerves on the, the left. If it's pinching right on the spinal cord, you will have what's called bilateral pain. It'll be on both sides. Now that's in the cervical region. If it's down in the lumbar region, the lumbar nerves are gonna supply the legs. So your pain's not gonna be up in the arms. If it's herniated down in the lumbar region of your back, then you're gonna have pain in the legs. Okay, it'll, again, it'll be the same thing. It'll be either on the right leg the left leg or bilateral, depending on where that herniation lies, okay? Um, now, I told you that a lot of times as we age, our discs get older, they start to degenerate. It's a condition called degenerative disc disease, and that can lead to herniation, but also lifting things the wrong way. So people that are otherwise super healthy, if you lift something with your back, you know, they say, don't lift with your back, lift with your legs. If you lift with your back, you're putting so much stress and pressure on your back that you can easily herniate and rupture a disc. Now, the image on the left over here, this is actually showing you an MRI of a herniated disc. So you can see that disc is squeezing out. You can see that bright white line, that is the spinal cord. So you can see it's pinching that spinal cord. Again, this is in the lower back. You can tell because this right here is the sacrum. And so you know the pain for this individual is going to be in the legs. Okay. Now I want to walk you through, when we look at our vertebrae, let's talk a little bit about the parts and pieces on our vertebrae. So we have the body of the vertebrae, which is this part right here. So we are looking at a vertebrae kind of down on the vertebrae. Um, the body of the vertebrae, you can see it's a big chunk of bone. So this is really going to bear the weight, and actually this is what the disc will sit on, right? So it's going to sit on top of that body. If you go back, you can see where that disc is sitting, that gray disc, right on the body of the vertebrae. So this is where the weight is going to be bared. The vertebral foramina. Um, so the word foramen, you're going to see this a lot this week. It means whole. If we change that word foramen and turn it into foramina, that's whole, it's just plural, okay? It's just holes. And so the vertebral foramen, you can only see one of them right here, is the hole right here, and it allows the spinal cord to pass through. So all the vertebrae stacked together, all those holes together would be the ver vertebral foramina. Now, the spinous process is right here. Now, if you feel your back, right, if you just kind of feel your back, sometimes we say we're feeling our spine. Well, you're not really feeling your spine, but you are feeling your spinous processes. So all those little bumps that you can feel on your back, those are those processes sticking out. We also have some that stick off to the sides called the transverse process. On your bones, Anytime you have a big projection sticking off, like the spinous process or the transverse process, it is there either because it's forming a joint or because you've got big muscles connecting there. And in this case, you've got big back muscles connecting to the spinous processes and to the transverse processes. You also have a superior and an inferior articular process. So the term articular or articulation, again, remember, it means joint. Oops. So a superior articular process is going to form a joint with the vertebrae above it. So we can see in this image right here, a process is just anything that sticks off the bone, any projection. 
So that articular process on this vertebrae that you can see here is just forming a joint with the vertebrae above it. Now in this image, you can't see the inferior articular process. It would be on the underside forming a joint with the vertebrae below it. And then lastly are the intervertebral foramina. Now remember, you know what this term means. It means holes. And in this case, notice it's not vertebral foramina, but intervertebral foramina. That prefix inter means between. So I'm going to flip back to this picture so you can see these. Intervertebral foramina are holes between the vertebrae. And the only way you see them is if you look at the vertebral column from the side. And now you can see all these holes between the vertebrae. These allow all the spinal nerves to pass through. Okay. Now we also have, remember, the sacrum at the bottom. The sacrum is vertebrae that have been fused together. This is going to articulate with the last lumbar vertebrae above it, so it's forming a joint with that last lumbar L5 above it, and it's also going to articulate with your hip bones on the sides. And I'll show you a picture of that. Oh, let's see. No, I'm not. Yes, I will. Hold on. It's going to take me a minute to get there. Oh, it's not the best picture, um, but you can see the hip bones here, and then here is the sacrum. You're kind of looking at this like if you're a gynecologist, like looking up that way, um, and you can see right here where the sacrum is connecting to those hip bones, okay? And again, we're going to look at all of these again on Wednesday as we go over some of these. Oops. Um, some of the major markings on the sacrum that you're going to look at this week are the sacral foramina. Again, you know that term means holes. So these are all the little holes in the sacrum. So you can see all those right here. Okay. Again, the holes are there because they're allowing blood vessels or nerves to pass. They are a passageway. The transverse lines of fusion or transverse lines of fission these are basically where the vertebrae have fused together. Again, your sacrum is about five vertebrae that have fused together. And so we can see those right here. So where all those body of the vertebrae have fused together. And then the sacral hiatus, this is basically um, the portion of the last sacral vertebrae that is not fused together. So you can see that right here. So it's sort of this opening down at the very bottom of the sacrum. Now the tailbone or the coccyx, this is about four vertebrae that have fused together um, and it is very small. Um, this one, I'm gonna write this off to the side. Uh, this one is a vestigial structure. I know I've used this term in the past when we talked about erector pili muscles. A vestigial structure is a remnant. It is something that we have in our bodies that's left over from our ancestors. It's not anything that we use today. It's just a leftover structure. We do not have tails, right? But we have a tailbone. We have a coccyx. So at some point, our ancestors probably had tails, and so this is just what's left over. It's a vestigial structure, provides us no function, okay? And you can see that coccyx right here. All right, so the last part of our axial skeleton is our bony thorax. The bony thorax is basically the thoracic cage. It's the ribs and the sternum. And in the back, it is the thoracic vertebrae. So I want you to think about this. So remember your vertebrae and the number of vertebrae. Remember you have seven cervical, 12 thoracic, five lumbar. You have 12 thoracic vertebrae. You also have 12 ribs, okay? All 12 of those ribs connect in the back to your 12 thoracic vertebrae. So in the back, you have thoracic vertebrae. Around the sides, you have ribs. And in the front, you have your sternum. 
Now the functions of your bony thorax is protection. This is a super protective area for all those vital organs up there, like the heart and the lungs. Also, it is a great place for your shoulders to connect. So your shoulder joints, like your shoulder and, I'm sorry, your scapula and your clavicle, these are gonna connect onto that bony thorax. It's also a great place for a lot of neck and back muscle attachment. Um, you have muscles between your ribs that allow your ribs to move when you breathe. If you, and we, we actually do this in anatomy too, when we do the respiratory system, if you were to take a tape measure and measure around your thorax, when you blow out, your thorax is going to be smaller. And if you take a big breath in, your thorax gets bigger. It does that because your ribs actually pivot up. A little bit. When they pivot up, it allows that space to get bigger and your lungs can fill with oxygen. Now the sternum is the bone in the front. It is sort of a dagger shaped bone. There are three bones in your sternum. The first is called the manubrium. Just under that is the body. And last, is the xiphoid process. So I'll show you a picture of these. It's not the best picture, but it's part of one. Um, we can see we're looking at the sternum. So we have a manubrium at the top. We have a body here. And then at the bottom, you can't see it. It's a little dagger shaped bone called the xiphoid process. Okay, so those are the three parts of your sternum in the front. <clears throat> now again, we do have our ribs. We have 12 pairs of ribs, match those 12 thoracic vertebrae. The ribs, we actually divide our ribs up into what's called true ribs. These are ribs one through seven. You start counting at the top. So one through seven are true ribs. And the reason is because they have direct connect, connections to the sternum up front. So they have cartilage that connects them to the sternum. Just under that, ribs 8, 9, and 10 are false ribs. These are false because they have cartilage connecting them to the sternum, but the cartilage sort of combines together before it connects to the sternum. So it's an indirect connection. And then lastly are our floating ribs. And floating ribs have no connection to the sternum. They're just kind of floating in there. Let me show you a picture. You can see here our true ribs really well. So you can see that rib coming in and then you can see it directly connecting with cartilage, okay? We can't see our false or our floating ribs from this image, but you can see the true ribs. Um, now we also have that covers all of our axial skeleton, right? So everything in the middle. We did the skull, the vertebrae, the ribs, and the sternum. Now we also have our appendicular skeleton, which is shoulders, arms, hips, and legs. Um, and so we say that your appendicular skeleton is the bones of the limbs and their girdles. The term girdle is just connection. Um, and so we have two girdles. We have our pectoral girdle, which is your shoulder. And we have a pelvic girdle, which is the hips. I do want you to know these terms um, because that term girdle is used a lot of times in uh, disorders. Like there's a type of muscular dystrophy that's called limb girdle muscular dystrophy that affects the limbs and the girdles, right? The shoulders and the hips. Um, so that term oftentimes gets used in disorders. So we're gonna start with the pectoral girdle. I remember this one because I think your pecs, right? Everybody knows the pecs are sort of the, um, the pectoralis major, pectoralis minor muscles up here in your chest. So pectoral girdle should make sense. It's up in the shoulders. There are only two bones that make up your shoulder joints. Those are the scapula and the clavicle.
there are very few bony connections here. In fact, the scapula, which is in the back, is made up of, it's just held in place by muscle, big back muscles hold it in place. And then the scapula connects at one point to the clavicle and the clavicle connects at one point to the axial skeleton. It's connecting to the sternum. That's it. So your entire shoulder is held on right here at one point at the sternum. So having very few bony connections means you have a great range of motion here in your shoulder joint. That also means that uh, it is very easy for you to damage your shoulder joint because of all of the soft tissues in there. So this is a great image showing you the scapula and clavicle. Um, so you can see in the back is our scapula. And then you can see right here at one point, that scapula, again, the scapula is not connected to your ribs. It's not held onto the ribs. It's held in place by muscle. And it is connected to the clavicle right here. And then here's your clavicle. We call this the collarbone sometimes. And it's connected only at this one place. So again, your entire shoulder is held on right here at one place to the axial skeleton. So very few bony connections, only one. Um, this is why when someone breaks their collarbone, you know, if you, if you break this bone, people end up in a sling and they cannot raise, they cannot move their arm at all. And that's because you have no connection anymore to the axial skeleton. You broke your connection. So you've got to wait for that to heal before you can use your arm again. Now the clavicle, the collarbone, this bone, which is, again, it's this one right here. So this bone is a bone that has a double curve to it. It's shaped kind of like an S when we look at it. Um, and um, we say that it has two ends. It has an acromial end. This is sort of towards the outside by your shoulder. And then it also has a sternal end. That should make sense. That's the one in here closest to the sternum. So if we go back to this picture, again, we have an acromial end out here and a sternal end here by the sternum. Um, this is actually the most broken bone in the body. Um, you know, if you land on your shoulder, typically you're going to break the clavicle. Um, and this bone, because of its double curve, the way it's curved, if it breaks, it usually breaks out, which is super important. If your clavicle breaks inward, you have a, the risk of puncturing a lung. So it is important when it breaks, it breaks out. The scapula, the bone in the back, this is sort of a triangular shaped bone. Um, and it has all these different bone markings on it. Um, it has, I'll show you a picture and do these. It has this one right here. Um, so this would be if you are looking at the back. So if you're looking at somebody's back, you can see this right here is called the spine of the scapula. In fact, you can feel this. So if you feel your shoulder, you should be able to feel this ridge back here that kind of moves up towards um, the outside edge of your shoulder. That's the spine of your scapula, okay? Now the spine of the scapula ends in this big process called the acromion. Now that one makes sense. I'm gonna go back because remember, the end of your clavicle is called the acromial end. And the reason we call it the acromial end is because it connects to the acromion, okay? Now there's also, if you'll notice, there are these big divots in the scapula. So you have a big divot right here, and another big divot right here. So above the spine and below the spine of the scapula. This is called the supraspinous fossa and the infraspinous fossa. Fossa means groove. Supraspinous, above the spine. Infraspinous, below the spine. These are huge grooves that allow big muscles to sit in. So remember I told you your scapula is not connected by bone anywhere. It is held in place by muscle. So having these big fossa help to hold it in place. Now you also have this notch at the top called a suprascapular notch. It allows a lot of nerves to go down into your arm. And if we were to flip 
the scapula over, you have another big groove on the underside. And that is called the subscapular fossa. Okay, notice it doesn't have spine in the name. Um, and it's just under the scapula. Okay, so those are some of the markings on the scapula. And again, we're going to go over all these together in lab on Wednesday during that lab lecture that we do. Now we're going to move down into our arms and then we'll do our hips and our legs. Okay, so in the in the arms, um, your arm has sort of three parts to it. It has what's called the brachium, that's your upper arm. It has your forearm, which is called the antibrachium. And then it has the hand, which is the manus. You have 37 bones in your arms. Now I want you to think about this. Your upper arm, one bone. Your forearm, two bones. That means the majority of the bones, 34 of them are in your hand. So most of the bones that are in your upper limb are in your hands, okay? So your arm, the sole bone of the brachial region is called the humerus, okay? The forearm has two bones. This is the antibrachial region. It has the radius and the ulna. So let me show you a picture of these, okay? Here are the radius and the ulna. So these are the two bones in the antibrachium in your forearm. Um, how I remember the difference between these two, um, the radius is this one over here. And if you'll notice the top of the radius, it's very rounded. It almost looks like the head of a nail if you're gonna hammer something in. So that is what the radius looks like. The ulna is this one. And the ulna, the top of it looks like a C, so it almost looks like a crescent wrench. So those two bones, even though they're both in your forearm, they look very different from each other. So you should be able to identify those. Now, another way you can tell, if you're looking at like a whole skeleton, when you are in anatomical position, again, think anatomical position, the thumbs are pointed away from you, right? Your palms are forward. The ulna is always gonna lie towards your little finger, your pinky finger. It's always medial, closest to the midline. The radius is always lateral. It's always gonna be on the thumb side. I remember that because you know, if you are in healthcare, sometimes you'll have to take a pulse in other places than up here, right? Sometimes you don't take a pulse here. Most of the time, you don't take a pulse here. Most of the time, you take a pulse right here. And we call this a radial pulse. You always do it near the thumb, okay? So if you press lightly, you should be able to feel your pulse on the thumb side where the radius is. Okay. Whoops. Um, so the ulna, which again, this is the one that's going to lie on the pinky side, your ulna is going to make up most of your elbow joint. That's where it has that big C at the end of it. The radius is going to make up most of your wrist joint. That's where the radius is bigger. And we can see that in this picture. So you can see at the top, the ulna is much bigger at the top. And as you move down, it gets smaller, smaller, smaller as you get closer to your wrist. The radius is the opposite. The radius is small at the top near the elbow. And as you move down towards the wrist, you can see it gets a lot bigger. So this is why we say the ulna makes up most of your elbow, radius makes up most of your wrist. Now your hand, again, there's 34 bones in your hands. In the lab, you do have to know the names of all of these bones. Okay, so those are in your lab PDF. We'll do these in uh, lecture on Wednesday. So the hand, we kind of divide this up into your carpals, and the carpals are these bones right here. So these are the short bones in your body. Remember, a short bone is sort of a cube-shaped bone. So you have your carpals. The first set of long bones, these are called metacarpals. These are the bones that are in here, right? So these are the long bones in here, where your palm is. 
And then the phalanges are these three bones at the end that are making up the fingers. And again, those are also long bones. They are longer than they are wide. Okay, so you have carpals that are down in here in your wrist. You have metacarpals in your palm and phalanges in the fingers. So now we're going to move to the hips and the legs, okay? Um, your hips are formed by bones called oscoxae. That's what we call them when they are together. Um, together with the sacrum in the back, they form what's called the bony pelvis. And um, your bony pelvis is important because it is basically carrying the weight of your entire upper body. Um, and it's transmitting that weight down through your legs. It's also, if you think about the way it looks like a bowl, it is supporting all of your abdominal organs. So your pelvic bones, your os coxae, are actually three bones. You have an ilium, an ischium, and a pubis. Okay, so I'm going to show you a picture of these. This is one pelvic bone, and the one on the left is color-coded for those three bones within there. So this big paddle-shaped bone at the top, that's the ilium. The one in purple is the ischium, and the one in red is the pubis. So the ilium, this one that I circled, um, the ilium has, it's sort of the flared portion of your pelvic bones, and it has this ridge around the outside called the iliac crest. If you put your hands on your hips and you can feel your bone, that is your iliac crest, if you put your hands on your hip bones, okay? Now, um, um, remember when we did the nine abdominal pelvic regions and down in the bottom right and bottom left, we have a right iliac region and a left iliac region. Now you know why they're named that way. It's because of those hip bones. Now in the front, you have your pubis bones those are the ones in red. And towards the back and the bottom, that's the ischium in purple. In fact, this portion right here, this makes up something called your sits bones. And so this is like when you sit on your bottom, if you kind of wiggle around and you can feel your butt bones, you're feeling that uh, ischium. Now, I do want to mention a little bit about the pelvis, about the os coxae. I told you this, and we talked briefly about this in chapter six. How, remember, when you're growing and your skeleton is getting longer, you're getting bigger. Remember, there are two different hormones that play a role in the growth of your bones. One, when you're little, is the human growth hormone. The other are your sex hormones, and those are released when you hit puberty. Your sex hormones not only cause growth spurts, but they also cause the skeleton to become more masculine or more feminine. And so you can see this really well in a pelvis. So if we look at the image on the top, this is a female pelvis. Again, we're looking at this as if we're like the OBGYN getting ready to deliver a baby, right? So this female pelvis, you can see right here, see this uh, canal right here? Much bigger than down below. That's a male pelvis at the bottom. So that is helping have a larger birth canal since females carry and deliver babies. So we have this nice broad pelvis that allows for a bigger capacity, okay? Adapted for childbearing. The one on the bottom is a male pelvis. The male pelvis is not tipped forward as much. It is much more narrow. Okay? You can also see the hips are not flared nearly as much, and this cavity is much smaller. Um, and that actually helps to support the heavier upper body that men typically have. Now we're going to move down into our legs. Okay, So the legs, just like the arms, the legs are broken into three parts. You have a thigh, which is everything above the knee. You have the leg, which is below the knee. And then you have the foot. And just like we have with the arms, you have one bone in the thigh, two bones in the leg, and a whole bunch more in the foot, okay? 
Um, the bones that are in your leg, in your thigh, your legs, and your feet, though, are much bigger than what you find in the arms because they are going to bear the weight of your entire upper body. Um, so, in fact, the thigh bone is the biggest bone in the body. It's the biggest, strongest bone in the body. And that bone is called the femur. Largest, strongest bone in the body. A lot of people don't know this, um, but when people break their hip, if they have a broken hip, it is not actually a break in your os coxae. It's actually a break in the neck of the femur. So I don't have a picture of a femur on here. Um, I'll show you that image on Wednesday. But the femur has sort of a ball at the end, making up sort of your hip joint. And if you break it right before that ball, that is a broken hip. Okay, so it's not actually breaking your os coxae. The leg below the knee has two bones. It has the tibia, which is bigger. So the weight's gonna go from your femur to your tibia. And it also has a fibula. Ooh. The fibula is the small stick-like bone that's always lateral, it's on the outside. The fibula is not bearing a lot of weight. It is a tiny bone. Its job is to help stabilize the ankle. That's really its only job, okay? The tibia is the big bone below your, below your knee. This one's gonna bear a lot of weight. It's actually the second strongest, biggest bone in the body next to the femur. And then we're gonna move into the foot. Um, the foot is gonna support the weight of your body. It helps to propel you forward when you're walking and when you're running. Now, again, if we think about your body weight, it's going to go down the, down the thigh, so the femur, down the tibia in the leg, and then it's going to go into your feet. And so just like we had in the hands, we have the same sort of arrangement of bones in the feet. We have these short bones in here, and this time they're not called carpals, they're called tarsals. So when they're in the feet, they're tarsals. The first set of long bones are metatarsals, and then your toes, there's usually three bones in there, are the phalanges. So just like fingers are phalanges, toes are phalanges. I want you though to look at the tarsals. Your weight is coming down this way, down the tibia, and the two tarsals it's gonna hit are this one on the top, this is called the talus, and then this one on the bottom, it's really big. It's called the calcaneus, which are heel bone. These are really big for being tarsals. The rest of your tarsals are much smaller. These are so big because that's where the weight is being transmitted. Okay, so that was just sort of a brief overview of all the bones in the skeleton. Again, like I mentioned on Wednesday, I'm gonna go over all these bones in way more detail using your textbook. Okay, so we'll do all the images, we'll talk about all these bone markings that you have to know in your lab. For the disorders, the very end of this chapter, this part is really just walking through some disorders that we find typically in the developmental aspect. So in an embryo, in a developing fetus, we're going to see some of these disorders pop up. So the first one is called a cleft palate. Now at the very start of this lecture, we talked about the skull, and I told you that your skull bones are typically paired, if one on the right, one on the left. Typically what's gonna happen is as those bones are forming, they're gonna grow together at the midline. In cleft palate, something goes wrong and the bones do not meet in the middle and you end up with an opening. So the bones do not fuse medially and you end up with an opening. The reason we call it a cleft palate is because this affects the maxilla bone, which is here. It's all of this bone in here. And it also affects the palatine bone, which is your hard palate. If those bones don't fuse, you now have an open connection between the mouth and the nose. So this results, and I'll show you some pictures. Look at these sweet babies. Um, the pictures on the top is just looking at it from the front. And so you can see there's a deformity here from the front. The pictures on the bottom are actually showing you in from the oral cavity. And you are looking from the oral cavity. You can see here that hard palate. 
you can see where the bones did not come together. And so now you're looking from the mouth. This is the nose up in here. That's the nasal cavity. Same thing here. You can see the palate, right? It almost looks like a big hole in the top of the mouth, in the roof of the mouth. You're going straight into the nose. That's the, that's the nasal cavity. So this condition for a baby is very problematic because babies get nutrients by suckling, right? They're either breastfeeding or bottle feeding. If their mouth and nose are connected, right, and there's an opening there, they can't get a suction. So it interferes with suckling. It also, there is a huge risk of aspirating food. Um, if that food gets into the nasal cavity and goes down into that trachea, into the airway, that's aspirating food. So babies can die from this. So um, usually this requires surgery. So, and it usually requires surgery pretty early. Another really common condition that affects newborns is hip dysplasia. So this is about 4% of babies are born with hip dysplasia. This is caused by incomplete formation of the acetabulum in the coxal bone, in the hip bone. So that's one reason that, that this can be caused. So the acetabulum is um, the socket. So your hip is held together. It's a ball. We call it a ball and socket joint. So if this is my femur, the head of the femur is going to sit into the acetabulum, the socket. And so in babies with hip dysplasia, what happens is the socket is not fully formed and it's what we call shallow. So instead of being like this, where it holds the head of the femur really well, it's more like this. And so the head of the femur can slide out really easily, and that's hip dysplasia. It is basically um, the femur bone just slides out. It doesn't have a nice tight socket in there. The other thing that can cause hip dysplasia is the ligaments that hold the head of the femur into the acetabulum are loose and it allows the head of the femur to come out. Okay, so those are the two reasons that we see hip dysplasia. The remedy for this typically is a uh, harness. And so you can see in this picture, this is showing you the acetabulum. So here's the socket and you can see this is the femur bone. Here's the head of the femur, it's sort of this rounded ball, looks like a ball and socket. And if it's not in place, if it's dislocated, that's hip dysplasia. Um, and so you can see over here this picture um, on the right. That little nugget is in a little harness and it actually holds the legs out into the side and it allows the acetabulum to finish forming and get a nice tight socket in there. The other thing that it will do is if the ligaments are loose, by holding those legs out to the side and in place, the ligaments get tighter. Um, if you've ever broken a bone, right, and you've been in a cast for a while, a lot of times when your cast comes off, your joint is really stiff and you got to work on loosening it up. And so that's because the ligaments get tighter when you're immobilized. And so that's the point of something like this. Um, another disorder that, again, it's going to affect infants is uh, club foot. We actually, I've got some friends who just adopted a baby that has club foot. This is when the feet are inverted medial. So it's almost like the soles of the feet are touching, okay? And it'll cause, if it's not remedied, the child won't be able to walk. If they do walk, it's like they're walking on the ankles or the sides of the feet. So I'll show you a picture. So you can see this baby has club foot. So you can see the leg comes down and you can see that big turn in the feet. So you can see that um, essentially the soles of the feet are touching each other. So the remedy for club foot is really simple. It's just a series of stretching and casting. Stretch the feet out and cast them in place. Stretch it and cast it in place. And this takes a while. It'll take multiple stretching and casting events and it'll take months for this to get fixed, but it can get corrected. And I think this is the last disorder that I have. Again, this is all, these are all developmental disorders. They all happen in utero during gestation. This last one, spina bifida, again, a developmental birth defect. Um, this is when the spinal cord does not completely form. So um, typically the spinal cord is, the brain and spinal cord are one of the first things to develop in a developing embryo. 
um, usually before you even know you're pregnant, that brain and spinal cord are already forming. Um, usually around four weeks of development is when brain and spinal cord start forming. So a lot of women don't know this, but um, when you miss your period, so the day you miss your period, you are already considered four weeks pregnant. So if it takes you like two weeks to figure out, oh, wait, I'm late. Well, you're already at six weeks. And so brain and spinal cord form super early. So it is not uncommon for women that early, they might not know they're pregnant. They might not be trying to get pregnant. So they're not taking prenatal vitamins, right? They may not be taking care of themselves very well. Um, and so the brain and spinal cord are very subjected to any kind of outside stress, any kind of environmental toxins or toxins you're putting in your body. Um, and so what happens if the spinal cord does not completely form, it sort of starts to form and then it stops, you get this big ball of, of non-functioning nerves. And the vertebrae, when they start forming at around seven weeks gestation, they can't fuse around the spinal cord. They can't form around that big ball of nerves. And so you end up with this big mass, a protruding mass. And so I'll show you a picture. Um, the image on the left, so this is cervical spina bifida. You can see this big mass right here where the vertebrae were not able to fuse around that. Um, and the one on the right, this is lumbar spina bifida. Now, I want you to think of the spinal cord as like the highway, right? So your brain's the command center. The spinal cord is the highway. It's sending things down from the brain and back up. Okay. Um, if the spinal cord stops forming, that would be essential to closing the highway. So over here on the left with cervical spina bifida, the highway closed really early. And so there is very little information that can pass from the brain down. So most of the time in infants that have cervical spina bifida, they are quadriplegic. They cannot move their arms, they cannot move their legs because they cannot get that information down to their limbs. In infants that have lumbar spina bifida, notice that highway is open a little longer before it's shut. So they can get information out to their arms, but probably not their legs. And so in this case, they would be paraplegic, okay? Um, now they can go in and correct the bulge so that they don't have a big bulge, but they cannot restore function to the spinal cord. Um, so that's not something that they can do. Now, one thing that we know is that folic acid prior to conception has been shown to decrease the risk of spina bifida by 70%. That's huge. And notice it says prior to, sorry, I got some tools down here that are in my way. There we go. It says prior to conception. So there's actually now a birth control pill. I don't know the name of it. Um, I'm old. I'm not on that stuff. Um, but there is a birth control pill that um, they target it for women who aren't quite ready to have babies yet, but might be in the next, you know, couple of years. Um, and this birth control pill has not only all of the hormones in it to prevent pregnancy, but it also has all your folic acid in it. Um, and the goal here is to make sure that you are building up your folic acid before conception because that has shown to play a huge role. So if you are planning on getting pregnant, if you're trying to get pregnant, you need to be taking a prenatal vitamin. You need to be getting all of your folic acid to prevent something like this. And again, you need it prior to conception because that brain and spinal cord forms so early. Okay. So that is it for chapter seven, super short chapter. Again, I told you we'd get it done in one day.